Hello, welcome along to the smartest show in the universe. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan. This is the podcast where we explore what's going on in the galaxy and we try and search out some science secrets that are lurking nearby. This week, we'll learn all about conservation with wildlife expert Lizzie Daly, who travels all around the world helping humans and animals live better together. The whole campaign that's been put together, uh, it's called One Million Actions, run by the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And within that, there's this guide of actions for animals with 50 really exciting tips for different animals. And as I said, there's there's so much you can do. I think one of the main things to take away from this is that no matter who you are, where you live, the environment that surrounds you, there are ways that you can connect. Also, we'll take a trip to Deep Space High to look at what jobs you can do up in space if you love citizenship at school. Do you want to tell us what your favourite lesson is? I'm the class representative on the Deep Space High School Council. It's a really cool thing, although I'm not sure it sets me up for a career in the stars. And what is it that you like about being on the school council? We come up with ideas to make the school the best in the solar system and make sure everyone's happy and feel like they're part of things and help to solve problems too. What you're describing sounds a lot like citizenship. People working together to make positive differences to the society in which they live. And I've got your questions to answer this week. They're on what happens inside a black hole and we'll try and figure out the deadliest thing on planet Earth. It's all coming up in a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's kick things off with your science in the news. This has been an amazing story. Dusty samples from the most dangerous known rock in the solar system have been brought back to Earth. NASA landed the materials in a capsule over in America last week. The bits of rock were collected from an asteroid called Bennu three years ago. And NASA wants to know a lot more about this asteroid because it's one of the deadliest things we know about. It's got a tiny, tiny chance of hitting planet Earth in the next 300 years. Now, that's not something to get worried about, but also it's really important that we're looking at this dust because there might be some answers in there for questions of how the solar system and the Earth was formed ages ago. Also, scientists have made a key discovery about antimatter, which is a strange, mysterious substance, which there was a lot of when the universe began. Now, antimatter is the opposite of matter. Matter is stuff that stars and planets are made from, and we think that both equal amounts of matter and antimatter were made during the Big Bang. Uh, Matter is everywhere, but antimatter is very hard to find. But experts have discovered that the two respond to gravity in the same way, which has opened the doors to some more questions about how antimatter might have been used in how the Earth was made over four billion years ago. It's always strange trying to get your head around antimatter and dark matter stuff that is there we know it's there but we can't find it we don't know where it is also finally this week british bird lovers will see a very different pattern of species as the climate warms that's what experts say they say climate change is bad news for birds but locally in the uk we'll have winners and losers because populations of birds that are native to the uk are going down as the world gets hotter but creatures and birds from all around the world are leaving the hot places that they're from right now and coming to the UK because it's a bit cooler than that. So it's going up and down. It's, again, very tough to get your head around. Bad news for some birds, but good news uh, for other more exotic birds that they can come and live here. Let's catch up with Techno Mum then. One of our favourite gadget geniuses on the show. She's always here every week answering some of your questions about technology and uncovering the mysteries of how tech of the future is made, why it's there, what it does. This week we're catching up with Techno Mum and Tim, her son, to talk about sat-navs and GPS. Your mum or dad, your grown-up might have one of these when you're in the car. It lets you know where you're going, but how do they work? Techno Mum, with the Institution of Engineering and Technology. Advancing and sharing technology. Mum and me were off to the Turbo Gadget Expo. It's a massive show in the city centre all about, well, gadgets. Brilliant. Trouble is, we were driving in the car and we were lost. Decidedly less brilliant. 
I was sure this dual carriage ray brought us out onto the ring road, but where's this roundabout come from? I don't think Mum had been this way for a while. That roundabout looked older than I was. Um, why don't you use a sat-nav, Mum? Good idea, Tim. Can you plug it in for me, please? Sat-nav is a handy gadget that is like a moving map showing exactly where you are. And if you tell it where you want to go, it can find your route, too. Cool, huh? It's loading up now. It says, locating satellite. Cool. Is that what the sat bit stands for? Satellites. That's right. Sat-nav means satellite navigation. Satellites constantly orbit the Earth, and they all know exactly where they are in space. They have synchronised atomic clocks inside, too. The most accurate clocks on the planet. You mean the most accurate clocks in the sky? Well, quite. So the satellites know exactly when they are there, too. They are constantly beaming this information down to Earth. Devices like SatNav simply collect those signals, then they use an internal clock to determine how long the signal took to arrive. This tells them how far away you are from the satellite. And that tells the SatNav, and the person holding it, where it is. Not quite, because you see it knows how far away you are, but this could be in any direction from the satellite, including up into space. So GPS gadgets like SatNav use two or three other satellites to pin your location down. GPS? That sounded familiar. Doesn't Dad have a GPS on his phone? I think it was helping him find the nearest chemist when we were out, and he uses it when he's jogging to see how far he's gone. Yes, GPS stands for Global Positioning System. Loads of mobile phones have it in these days. It's what tells them, and our sat-nav, exactly where it is. And once our sat-nav knows where we are, I suppose it can check a map to see where you need to go. Precisely. The computer inside the sat-nav overlays maps and works out directions. And hopefully it'll get us out of this jam. It's loaded up now, Mum. I'm just typing in our destination. Uh, Mum, it seems to think we're heading towards the motorway. Yes, if we carry on, we're going to have to leave the city totally. And, by the look of it, be halfway to Granny's house. Turn around. Where possible. I think it wants us to turn around, Mum. Turn yes, around. I'd gathered that. I hope you don't miss the show. Bear left. Um, looking at this, shouldn't you be bearing left now? Cheeky, do you want to do the driving? Yeah, that'll be way cool. I wasn't being serious, you know. Techno Mum, with the Institution of Engineering and Technology. Advancing and sharing technology. <laughs> Let's get to your questions then. Loads of ways that you can get a question answered on this show. About anything science, send it in and I will make sure that I answer it. I will do the digging. I will find it out for you. You can send it as a voice note on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslive.com. That's how I'd love to hear from you. This is from Alex in Weybridge, who has sent it in as an email to me, who wants to know what would happen if you went inside a black hole. Well... How a black holes are made, experts think, it's when a star dies. At the end of a star's life, it collapses in on itself. And stars are massive, right? And big things have a lot of gravity. It eats itself inwards. And all that gravity has to go somewhere, so it sucks everything nearby into it. It's like this vortex. Things keep going in and coming in. Not even light can escape it. That's why it's a black hole. No light there. And if you were to go inside a black hole, well, you would be squashed. You would be stretched. You would be pulled to something so thin, it's like a tiny, tiny, tiny shoelace. It's a speck called a singularity. That gravity would crush you. And that's what would happen if you went inside a black hole, Alex. Thank you so much. This is from someone who has left a review for the Fun Kid Science Weekly on Apple Podcasts. They call themselves Very Old Man 12. I can't think that's their real name. They want to know, what's the deadliest living thing? Ah, well, there are many different ideas about this. The deadliest animal today could be seen as the hippopotamus because they're a huge beast. Normally weigh over a ton. They can run at 30 kilometres an hour. They've got a shockingly strong bite, sharp, crushing teeth, and they're very territorial, which means if you go near their home, they are aggressive, they charge, they show no mercy. And because they're so big and fast, there's very little chance that you'll get away. Also, mosquitoes are incredibly dangerous. Tiny flying insects that feed off of sucking your blood. The problem is, when they take some of your blood, they push back bacteria, kind of backwash, and push these viruses into your body. And these illnesses are incredibly deadly to humans. And that's why they're one of the most dangerous beasts on the planet, which is amazing because they're tiny. If we're looking at deadly beasts from history, well, we've got to talk about megalodon. 
It's a massive shark from 20 million years ago. They could grow 20 metres long. They weighed over 60 tonnes. Their teeth were thick, robust and sharp. They were brilliant at breaking bones. Now, they could bite down with the force of 150,000 newtons. To put that in perspective, we spoke about the hippo bite earlier. Well, they chomp down with 8,000 newtons. So the bite of a megalodon was almost 20 times stronger than a hippo bite today. So take your pick, really. It's tough to find out which is the deadliest animal, but one of those I think would do a lot of damage. Thank you very much. For next week, I would really love to hear your voice. I would love you to star on the podcast. So do me a favour, open up the free Fun Kids app. You can record a question on there. You can also do it by uh, recording one on the Science Weekly page over at funkidslive.com. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. This week, we are chatting to wildlife biologist Lizzie Daly. You might know her from Winter Watch on the BBC Curious Creatures 2. She's got a new show and she knows a few things that you can do to help out animals because they live on this planet with us. So how can we make it easier on them? Uh, Lizzie, thank you for joining us. Tell us, what's a really easy thing that we can do as humans just to make life a bit easier for the animals that share this planet with us. Thank you for having me. Very exciting. There's loads you can do. I think the whole campaign that's been put together, uh, it's called One Million Actions, run by the International Fund for Animal Welfare. And within that, there's this guide of actions for animals with 50 really exciting tips for different animals. And as I said, there's there's so much you can do. I think one of the main things to take away from this is that no matter who you are, where you live, the environment that surrounds you there are ways that you can connect so just as an easy pick you know most people are near a a patch of uh, greenery or there's some trees or they have a garden or they live near a park so take notice of the birds around you that's probably one of the easiest ones because no matter where we are there will be some wildlife in some capacity and whether you're in, in an urban environment in London that's still the same um as whether you're you know in a more of a rural area so why is that important Taking notice of the birds that we have here can tell us a lot about the health and status of our natural environment. So, you know, if um, over time we build up an understanding of this, we can learn about how numbers are declining or increasing over the years. And there's an incredible citizen science project that happens every January. It's called the Big Garden Bird Watch. I'd encourage everyone to get involved, uh, to get involved. Uh, all you have to do is go sit sit in your window with a cup of tea with your family, friends or in the garden and just write down the species that you get in your garden. And this helps monitor trends over time. And as I mentioned, this is really important for us to get a grip on how numbers are declining and how we can all help um, and give back to our birds. On the opposite side of that, uh, uh, what do we do as humans that might be really quite harmful to ecosystems that are all around us and things that we don't even realize we're doing without meaning to cause harm we're actually having quite an impact yeah i mean you mentioned there about our connection to the natural world we can coexist with wildlife but unfortunately we live in a world now which is more separate from our from our natural environment so it's about re-establishing that i mean day to day we go around in our cars um traveling from work or to school and then we sit on these laptops and type all day and we're very uh sedentary and we're kind of yeah separated from from what's out there so I think thinking about what you do day to day how you travel can have an impact uh, the food that you eat can have an impact um the clothes you wear uh the devices that we're using it's it's kind of all a bit alien really and that's kind of evolved over time and you know that's that's part of the very fast-paced urban life that we live now um but uh, you know on the other side it's it's not that we we don't have that connection. It's about finding ways to kind of reignite that connection with the outdoors. So this Actions for Animal Guide, which is out, loads of animal-loving heroes <laughs> have kind of got involved and told us some of these 50 things that we can do to help animals. So you've spoken about the big bird watch. That happens once a year. Is there anything that we can do to help animals from this 50 list that we can do maybe more day to day? Yeah, so if anyone wants to get kind of uh, inspired and get that kind of feeling of a collective effort to to do something, download the guide. If you go on iforce, that's ifaw.org, type in actions for animals, you will see all of the actions there. 
I mentioned a simple one. It's one that, you know, we can all connect to, but there's loads on there. You could rewild an area of your garden. You can make a frog pond. You know, you could help pollinators by planting wild flowers. There's an extensive list on there, but it's also made up of things which perhaps reach further afield because I, one of the best kind of sayings in, in what we can do as individuals is act local, think global, because many of the issues that we're facing here are seen all across our oceans, all across the planet. So one of them, for example, is about signing a petition to help the North Atlantic right whale. They're, they're threatened by vessel strikes and entanglement in fishing gear. It's something that we see here with our cetaceans, our whales, our sharks, you know, overfishing in our waters as well. Now, that petition, if you were to sign it, really puts a call out on the US and Canadian government to take action to help protect the whales, to just reconsider how we're moving and behaving in the worlds of these animals. And essentially, you you know, people may think, oh, well, a petition may not do a lot. But if we're working as a collective, you know, this is under a campaign of one million actions. Let's say over a year we get to those one million actions. You know, it's just creating a really kind of good list of things that, that everyone can do, tangible things to give back. And I, I think that's that's really why I, I love this whole campaign, because so many of us feel like we have kind of running out of steam when we've seen so much negativity in the news you know we're going through a climate crisis so this is really invigorating in terms of putting that energy back into to actually being able to do something now you are a wildlife biologist on this show i yes. speak to a lot of people who kind of work around space and i always ask them what are they excited to find out in the next five or ten years Ooh. looking up and adventuring through space and I, I think it might be quite different for you, you to answer because I don't know how much we know about creatures, how much we're still waiting on. What questions with wildlife biology are you very excited to know the answer to? That is such a good question. I love that. I think, you know, we're very much an island nation here. And growing up for me, I was inspired by our coasts, our marine life. And there is so little we know about our seas. It's a great comparison because we know so much less about our seas than we do about about space even. So, you know, we're going we're talking about depths which go down to thousands and thousands of meters. And, you know, just recently we were out filming with the conger eel, which is an incredible species that can be found in our lochs, our lakes, our freshwater systems. And this is an animal that you can come face to face with here in the UK, but then travels out to sea to spawn and to die. It kind of finishes its life cycle, this epic journey. And it does so at thousands of meters below in the ocean. And I just use that as like a really kind of humbling example of how vast we need to be thinking in terms of how we're able to protect these environments and how much more we have to learn because there's so much we don't know about our deep seas and deep sea creatures. So ocean exploration is a really exciting area for me. But yeah, I think I think the whole idea that there's nothing else to really learn about a natural world is a bit limiting. I think there's so much more to learn and you definitely learn that as a biologist. You know, I'm tracking species like jaguars and elephants. So yeah, I'm constantly being reminded that there's uh, there's still a long way to go in terms of our connection and understanding. <laughs> Well, you mentioned Jaguars there. You've got this new show, Jaguar Journals, which is yes. on later this year. Tell us, what was it like tracking Jaguars? What were they putting <laughs> in their journals? <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a really great show. We're following the lives of five main characters of Jaguars that live in uh, in the Pantanal. It's kind of the south of the Pantanal in Brazil. It's a beautifully large wetland, but it's facing huge changes. You know, it's surrounded by lots of farmland. There's lots of conflict with people there outside of this kind of haven, if you like. So what you get is over 100 jaguars that kind of move in and out of this protected area and they all have their own stories, right? They're all, you know, um, having their own cubs and trying to start their own dynasties and there's males fighting with others and females trying to, you know, just make sure her cubs survive. So it's a really detailed account of these five brilliant jaguars and we follow these stories with the scientists that are working day in, day out there. Um, I won't tell you too much because I really want you to watch the show. Uh, it's going out on Sky at the end of this year so yeah if you want to see jaguars doing epic things brand new behavior and bringing science to life it's a series for you <laughs> i'm looking forward to it lizzie daly thank you so much for joining us thank you for having me for this week's dangerous dan where we look at some of the most mean wild deadly and strange things in the universe we're headed into the sky around the mountains of asia and africa to take a look at the bearded vulture 
This creature is also known as the Lamagaya. It's a huge bird, massive like an eagle, but it's a vulture. It's over one metre long, it's got a wingspan of three metres, it's brown with spots across its stomach, it's got black and white stripes across its head, it's got a curved golden beak with long claws. Because it's a vulture, that means it eats carrion, so it's like a scavenger. It goes and finds prey that other creatures have killed, and then normally it has a feast. And it's got a very strange way of actually eating its food. It flies along, and then it spots a carcass, a skeleton on the floor, and it picks a bone up, and then it will scoop it into the air, soar really high, flying way up in the clouds. It gets to about 80 metres high, and then it drops the bone, which then hurtles to the ground and shatters. This means the bearded vulture can scoop the delicious, nutritious bone marrow, which is inside the bone. That's what it lives on, and that's the only way you can get it, by hurtling bones to the floor from way up in the sky. Thing is, it's a near-threatened species, so it might be quite incredible and vicious, but it's also rare and very important, which means the bearded vulture goes straight onto our dangerous stand list. Before we finish up this week, if it's all right with you, we'll take a quick adventure, a little trip into Deep Space High, the smartest school in the solar system. This is from our Space for All series. It's all about the different types of careers and jobs that you can get in space. And there's loads more that you can do up there or down at Mission Control that's not just being an astronaut. In this episode, we'll find out what sort of jobs you can get in space if you love citizenship. Deep Space High, Space for All. All right, all right, settle down. Let's get started. Hang on, where's Sam? <sighs> Sorry I'm late. It was my turn to clean the pets out, and the space ferrets only went and escaped from their cage. It took me ages to round them all up. <laughs> Rounding up ferrets? I know the feeling. OK, we've been looking at the wide range of space jobs you lot could do when you leave school, and finding out that whatever you like, there could be a career in space for you. So, who's next? Dax? Do you want to tell us what your favourite lesson is? I'm the class representative on the Deep Space High School Council. It's a really cool thing, although I'm not sure it sets me up for a career in the stars. And what is it that you like about being on the school council? We come up with ideas to make the school the best in the solar system and make sure everyone's happy and feel like they're part of things and help to solve problems too. What you're describing sounds a lot like citizenship. People working together to make positive differences to the society in which they live. That could be a society as small as a school or as gigantic as a galaxy. And it's something that's been part of space exploration since the very early days. Let me demonstrate. Computer Sim, take us to London, January the 27th, 1967. You're witnessing history in the making. The United Kingdom, USA and Russia have just signed a treaty. It's called the Outer Space Treaty. And this incredible agreement states that the exploration and use of outer space shall be carried out for the benefit and in the interests of all nations. It means that, for example, no one country can own a planet. Not even if they put a flag on it? Not even then. They also agreed that celestial bodies such as the moon must only be used for peaceful purposes. Today, over a hundred countries have now signed the treaty. And working together hasn't stopped there. Computer. Baikonur Cosmodrome, November the 20th, 1998, if you please. Three, two, one, we have this off. We're at the launch of the Russian rocket Zarya. It's carrying the first piece of what will be the International Space Station into orbit. The space station is as much a human achievement as it is a technological one. And it was only possible because different countries work together. By sharing knowledge and work, the United States, Russia, Japan and Canada, along with the European Space Agency, were able to achieve more together than they could do on their own. OK, end sim. 
People who can organise others to work together, to share knowledge and to find new and better ways to do things are absolutely vital to space exploration. And with space tourism on the horizon, there'll be even more participants and it'll be more vital than ever to ensure as many people as possible can participate and that things are safe and fair for all. Sounds pretty cool. So, Sam, might you like to use citizenship skills to help organise the future of space exploration? I can even organise the space ferrets back into their cages. Not sure it's the career for me. <laughs> uh, we'll find something yet. We're out of time now, but let's keep thinking about your favourite lessons and interests, and you'll find space really is for all of us, including you, Sam. All right, class dismissed, quietly now. Sometimes I think space ferrets might be less trouble than you lot. Deep space high, space for all. With support from the UK Space Agency. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash space. And that's it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any science question that you want answered next week on the podcast, make sure you drop it as a voice note to me on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslife.com. You can hear loads of our brilliant podcast series over on Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you get your shows. They're on our app. They're on the website too. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. You can listen all over the country on the free Fun Kids app. And if you've got a smart speaker, uh, wake it up and then say, play Fun Kids. And I'll see you next week.